All right, let a little air out after yet another record close yesterday for the S&P futures. 30 minutes until the start of today's trading. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Sonali Basak. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. Coming up, stocks are set to slip after the S&P 500 pulled its posted its 41st record of the year. Goldman's David Kossin told us he sees more upside. And today we're going to get the view from Deutsche Bank, BlackRock and J.P. Morgan. And autos are in focus as Morgan Stanley downgrades General Motors, Ford and Rivian, citing headwinds, including China. In the next hour, we'll get insight on the luxury sector from the CEO of Rolls-Royce Motor Cars. Plus, two key earnings reports after the bell today. We'll get an AI update from Micron and an early read on Wall Street results from Jefferies. All that and more coming up. Let's take a look at where markets are trading 30 minutes until the bell rings. Like Matt said, a little bit of a breather yesterday. We managed to close at a record yesterday, but today you take a look at S&P 500 futures just slightly in the red. You could call that unchanged if you're an optimist, but the color is red. A little bit more direction in the NASDAQ 100, your big tech names. The big tech benchmark currently down about a tenth of a percent as bonds continue to sell off here just a little bit. You take a look at the 10-year yield, Matt, currently up to three basis points. All right, I'm looking here at U.S. stocks versus the rest of the world. This is on a valuation basis, and you can see that the valuation premium U.S. stocks hold is very high. If you looked inside that, you'd see a premium for big tech stocks over the rest of the industries in the S&P. And I'm going to ask Binky Chata about that when he comes on in just a few minutes. Hard to bet against America. But what about the American home builder? We're going to talk about home builder KB Home. It reported net orders for the third quarter that disappointed analysts and investors. KB Home's outlook for the year ahead was well above estimates. You do have the stock now down 5.7 percent pre-market. Also, also watching shares of Donald Trump's media company climbing after hitting its lowest level since 2021. The lockup period ended last week, but Donald Trump says he won't sell his stake. You see Trump Media and Telecom Group, uh, Technology Group up around 3.7 percent. Also, remember this big auto call. Morgan Stanley analyst Adam Jonas downgraded shares of GM, Ford, and Rivian. Jonas says that the move is driven by a combination of international, domestic, and strategic factors. We're going to talk more about that this hour, Matt. Yeah, can't wait to talk cars, but we have to start on the record, the 41st record, as Shanali pointed out, that we hit yesterday on the S&P 500. So stocks continue to be powered um, to new highs, and it's really still this big tech, you know, NVIDIA play mm -hmm. driving it. NVIDIA is adding uh, more than 22 percent of the gains that we've seen this year. And outside of NVIDIA, it just seems like there's very little fear in this market. If you take a look at the VIX, for in instance, we're back below 16 at the index level very little demand for put protection here. So even with these records that we're inching to, it feels like every day, not really seeing the, the fear creep in, Shali. All is calm, all is well. And what's interesting, you saw yesterday a little bit of fear in the market after that consumer data came out, weaker than expected. However, the market shrugged that off. Let's see if that trend continues. All right, joining us at the table is Deutsche Bank Chief Global Strategist and Head of Asset Allocation, Binky Chada. And Binky, uh, you have nudged your target up for the S&P to 57.50. We're near as damn it to it right now. Um, so what happens for the rest of the year? Do you just sit back and... So I think the question for the equity market is, are we going to get the typical, you know, pre-election pullback? I think... Historically, in uh, close elections, um, you know, the playbook is very clear, starting about a month earlier. So that's the first week of October. The market has tended to sell off four to five percent. Uh, and, and, and then in an election, in, in, in a close election year mm -hmm. in uh, the month prior to an election. So. We've just had two back-to-back -back pullbacks. Yes, we are at a new high, but we're just sort of like 1% above where we were, you know, uh, at uh, the mid-July peak. So we haven't really done that much. And uh, our baseline view is, you know, there's a strong potential for a pretty typical pullback right. uh, before the election, as typically happens, as investors basically uh, buy protection for potential volatility around the election. Mm. 
And as long as you get a clear resolution, if it doesn't have to be that night, it doesn't have to be by midnight, uh, but as long as you get a clear resolution, the market has tended to rally as that premium comes out, basically, regardless of which candidate wins. And so, you know, I think about the elections as sort of, there is a very familiar sort of, uh, most people are familiar with what's called the dollar smile, so I'm picking a different asset class here, which mm -hmm. is things do this in a range, but once you go out of the range, things change or the relationship changes. Right. And I think that sort of applies here because, yes, the election premium should come out, but obviously we've got five weeks till the election, so the question is, you know, how is the market going to behave? if the polls start to move. Well, uh, Binky, marry that sort of typical playbook that you see, of course, uh, a little mm -hmm. bit of a pullback into an election and then maybe a rally coming out of a clear resolution and mm -hmm. uh, emphasis on a clear resolution. When you marry that against the macroeconomic backdrop, of course, what we're seeing when it comes to fundamental earnings power from corporate America, does it make sense then that you would want to buy that pullback that you're expecting? Uh, it, it, that is correct, but you know, buying a pullback is easier said than done because you've got to pick your point. Uh, it, 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 if you buy too early, you're still going to lose some money. You buy too late, uh, you know, you already lost some if you took it off. Uh, it, it, and, and, and so, you know, from a medium term, which is a three-month point of view, I would just, uh, you know, sort of stay steady is the way that I would put it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it argues for buying the pullback at some point. We get, uh, you know past five to seven percent, yeah. Well, that was what I was going to ask. How much of a drawdown do you really see? How much of a pullback do you see in this market? And also, where do you buy? Yeah. The, the S&P equal weight hitting a fresh record, but the NASDAQ 100 still off of its highs. Yeah, so, so you know, I think there's uh, little doubt. I mean, you guys were just talking about equity valuations. Uh, they're on the high side, but I would say they're sort of pushing the limit of uh, fair value or deviations really from fair value. We think fair value in the S&P 500 is about 18 times earnings. We're trading 22, 23 times. Uh, a four-point deviation is pretty typical as the market price is in a recovery or a decline. Uh, and so we're sort of pushing that limit. But what I would keep in mind is that, you know, simple way of thinking about the equity market is Earnings come from the economy, so that's about the macro outlook. The PE that goes, you know, the P that goes into the PE depends on a lot of other things, uh, not just whether equity investors, you know, think basically that equities are expensive. So we like to look at uh, uh, where equity prices are going, basically from what we call our very simple demand supply framework. So we have changes in positioning, which of course gets all of the attention. But there is also, to keep in mind, equity inflows. So changes in positioning is changes in how existing equity mandates are getting managed. Then there is the new money coming in, uh, which is equity inflows. And of course, we have the biggest player, which is the buybacks. Now, one of the things that's been very different this year is that we're getting very, very, very robust uh, inflows into equities. And that's something to keep in mind. Um, and, and when one thinks about valuation, all I'm saying is, you know, the P is driven by the market. It depends on things like risk appetite and risk appetite is strong and it's likely it to remain strong. strong because if you think about the economy and the cycle and where we are, we're actually in a pretty unique place where yeah. unemployment's pretty close to 4%. Right. Most people would say full but, employment, but what yeah. typically does not happen when you're at full employment is having you know, six, seven quarters of 3% GDP growth, which I, well, is what we also, also we, we had six quarters of uh, earnings recession for the yeah. rest of the S&P, right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody's bullish big tech, and like every guest we have on yeah. remains bullish big tech. I want to ask you about the valuations and uh, if they're justified. Gina Martin-Adams from Bloomberg Intelligence says of U.S. large cap stocks, tech sector multiples are so extreme that consensus for sales would have to jump more than 50 percent over the next year just to meet recent valuations. Um, are we too bullish on this sector? And it's, you know, it's mostly chips and hardware. That's like more than half of it. So, so I, I would actually argue that uh, in the near term, so I'm thinking about three or four months mm -hmm. out, basically, we already had a D rating in tech. And I would argue the D rating is essentially done for now. 
where do I but well, well deserved. Look at uh, earnings growth on the uh, Mag Seven. I think we have a chart showing that it's slowed way down. Right. And if you look at the forecasts, okay, they're all for I don't know, 18, 19, 20 percent earnings growth. Uh, there's the chart. But those are just forecasts, right? Right. So, so you know, I think the way you think about mega cap growth in tech earnings is there's a very, very clear trend channel for the last 25 years. And what we did is, uh, uh, I would say the earnings recession was actually in mega cap growth in tech, had very limited impact basically outside of that, exception maybe energy and materials, which is uh, unrelated. Uh, and, and, and so what mega cap growth in tech earnings have done is gone from the bottom of the channel uh, to the top of the channel from the fourth quarter of 2022 to uh, the fourth quarter of 2023. Now, it's a very solid channel, but it's only 11% growth, which by any standards is very, very robust. And the point I'm simply getting at is we got 40% earnings growth in the fourth quarter of last year for them. We got very modest slowing 38% in the first quarter of this year. But if they have the best possible earnings and they hug the top of the channel, which is what they've been doing, mm. that implies 11% growth rate. And equity positioning in mega cap growth in tech was sort of aligned with 40% growth continuing. The good news is that positioning has been cut uh, uh, pretty sharply, pretty dramatically. And it's sort of in line with what we are expecting in the mid to low 20s for the third quarter. So that's why I say, you know, the necessary adjustment has happened. Now, we haven't adjusted down to 11%, but, you know, as you also said, it's a forecast. So uh, the, right. the market's not going to be in a hurry to adjust to what's going to happen at the end of next year. Uh, it's uncertain. So, uh, but I think for now, uh, it's kind of clear. And, and, and if you don't like all this fancy stuff about positioning and growth and numbers, and, you know, just look at the NASDAQ 100 relative to the S&P 500. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very, very clear trend channel of outperformance. And, and we've just bounced a little bit from the bottom of the channel. So both things are saying exactly the same thing. For now, it looks to be done. All yeah. right. That's a good place to leave it. Binky, really appreciate your time today, of course, breaking down big tech valuations, maybe a little bit more in line with, of course, the valuations when it comes to positioning. That is Deutsche Bank Chief Global Strategist and Head of Asset Allocation, Binky Chada. Meanwhile, you take a look at futures right now, about 20 minutes to go until the bells ring. You can see still not too pretty out there. The S&P 500 pretty much unchanged, but not exactly in the green. The Nasdaq 100, a tenth of a percent lower. And the small caps trying to go green, trying to get a sustainable gain there. The Russell 2000, I'm going to go ahead and call that unchanged. There's nothing happening in I futures. Know. <laughs> Maybe there's something happening underneath the hood. Let's get a t look at those stocks moving ahead of the opening bell with Abigail Doolittle. There certainly is, Katie. Let's start off with the shares of Flutter Entertainment, the online gambling holding company popping sharply higher today, up about 9.2%. This as they provide a 2027 outlook that is really positive for the overall online gambling community here in the U.S. They're saying it will be $63 billion. That's 50% better than the prior outlook. This is also bringing up DraftKings. In addition, Flutter has announced a $5 billion buyback. One company weighing to the downside, though, uh, ServiceNow, the enterprise software company, company, those shares down about more than 2%. We do have Piper Sandler saying that one of the companies that is caught in a DOJ probe, that this is a major revenue contributor to ServiceNow, about 40%. So those stocks, that stock down, uh, down about 2% again, as there is a bit of an overhang. And then finally, one reason that the uh, futures are hanging in there right around even. Take a look at the shares of NVIDIA and Micron. NVIDIA in particular up about nine tenths of 1%. So uh, it does seem that investors to some degree are uh, in on that AI trade today. I would note though, Shanali, NVIDIA still within a range. So it's not clear that the bulls are really taking this one higher, but at least today, a little bit of a relief there. A lot of movement, Abby. Have you ever put on a sports bet before? I have not. <laughs> well, you know, it's very easy to see as a new sports better myself exactly why FanDuel is making all that money on all those parlays. Now, coming up, we're going to talk about Boeing, a big offer here, but this plane maker still has a strike on its hands. That's up next. This is Bloomberg.
Let's get to high interest now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Israel is stepping up its heaviest air attacks on Hezbollah targets in Lebanon since 2006, with hundreds of people killed so far. The IDF also shot down the first missile ever fired by the militant group at Tel Aviv. The Iranian president spoke out against the bombing of Lebanon at the UN yesterday, condemning what he called Israel's crimes against humanity and called on the international community to intervene. Among the death toll yesterday, 50 children in southern Lebanon. Caroline Ellison was sentenced to two years in prison. The former CEO of Alameda Research was charged with fraud and money laundering after the collapse of crypto exchange FTX. Ellison will serve her prison term starting on or after November 7th. And OpenAI pitched the Biden administration on the need for massive data centers that could ease use as much, uh, easily use as much power each as entire cities. CEO Sam Altman was among other tech leaders at a recent White House meeting with government officials. He used the opportunity to share a document outlining the economic and national security benefits of building five gigawatt data centers in various U.S. states. To put that in context, five gigawatts is roughly equivalent to five nuclear reactors or enough power for three million homes. Shanali? The union representing 33,000 Boeing workers on strike have rejected the company's latest proposal to hike wages by 30 percent, and it's describing it as inadequate and disrespectful. We're going to bring in Bloomberg's Benedict Camel, who runs our global aviation coverage. You look at this latest offer Boeing has put on the table here. It's not quite meeting the initial demands. Is this a matter of leverage that the union has over Boeing at this juncture, or is this a matter of getting what they think is right at this point? point in time. Well, at this point, the two sides still seem quite far apart. Uh, the union saying we have no interest in negotiating this latest offer. As you said, 30 percent is what's on the table uh, from Boeing on wages. They've also sweetened a couple of other things. Uh, but this remains at least sort of 10 points below what the unions would like to see. Now, most people would think, well, 30 percent, that's a pretty nice sweetener on my, on my salary. But you've got to remember that these unions um, feel that they were shortchanged uh, in the last round about a decade ago. Uh, inflation has really hurt a lot of workers. So they are out here to get as much as they can. And given the dire straits that Boeing is in, they probably feel now is a good time to do this. We're never going to have this window of opportunity again. So they are digging in. It's a great point that 30 percent, obviously a huge number there, but you make the good point that you have to think about the base that they're starting from. I want to talk about what this means for Boeing. There was a really interesting analysis out from Jeffries estimating that basically the strike, it shut down production of the 737 MAX, other jetliners. It could drain an additional $1.3 billion in cash from Boeing each month. I mean, how painful is this for Boeing when you think about all the other issues it has right now? Well, that's exactly the point. I mean, this is a company that went into this strike already reeling. I mean, we all remember uh, what's been going on at Boeing since January 5th, since that accident on, on the Alaska Airlines plane. Um, and since then, they've tried to sort of regain their footing, but it's been, it's been very difficult. They were sort of getting there slowly. The production of the cash cow 737 started inching up again, and then the strike happened. So they are in an incredibly difficult uh, position here. And for them, in some ways, it's about sort of striking a balance between what will another sweetener cost us versus um, what does it cost us to prolong this strike? By some estimates, it's about $100 million a day that it's costing Boeing in terms of cash. And frankly, cash that the company does not have. In the first six months of the year, they lost $6, million, uh, $6 billion in cash flow. Um, the credit rating is dangerously close to junk. So all of these, these things together put them in a very difficult negotiation position. How much of this is about the bad relationship between Boeing management and union uh, management because, you know, the union um, was angry, the, the leaders were angry that Boeing went around those leaders and actually offered this to, you know, the base, to the actual workers. They said it was disrespectful. Mm -hmm. um, but does it really matter if they're giving the workers what the workers want? 
normally you would think, yes, there's, there's a way to go about this, and you, you negotiate with the union, and then the union presents it to the workers. This time, Boeing took a bit of a gamble when they threw in the suite, and they said, let's circumnavigate the unions, go straight to the workers. The trouble is, the offer they came with, those 30%, was a bit of a low-ball approach. So if you're going to do that, you might, ha you know, might have to come in with something more substantial, really a sort of knock-it-out-of-the-ballpark type offer, closer to the 40%. Then they might have succeeded in driving a wedge between the workers and the unions this way, it seems it's only hardened the resolves of the union and the workers, um, and it might be a bit of a miscalculation on the side of Boeing. It's, it will be interesting to see whether they can sort of patch that up again, get back to the negotiation table. The last round last week, they spoke with a mediator. Both sides say, we want to get back at the table, but at this point, there doesn't really seem to be a very clear resolution. Benny, thanks so much. Benny DeCamel there coming to us from our Berlin bureau talking about uh, the Boeing strike because Benny has such amazing experience with uh, the airline industry and uh, airliner production. Coming up, the spice is spiked. Coca-Cola ditches its newest flavor. We'll have details in Social Climbers next. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company is making waves this morning. And first up, Paramount Global is cutting more jobs as part of a $500 million cost-cutting effort announced in June. The media company is paring back its U.S. workforce, mainly targeting employees in the marketing, communications, and technology departments. Next up, we have Stitch Fix unraveling after the personal styling platform issued weaker than expected forecasts for the next year. Analysts are also disappointed by the company's projection that it will only return to revenue growth by the end of 2026. You can see shares currently down 29%, so traders clearly disappointed as well. And finally, Dr. Pepper fans can rest easy because Coca-Cola announcing today that it's discontinuing its spiced flavor less than a year after it hit shelves. The beverage, of course, it blended the traditional Coke flavor with raspberry notes, and it was the first alternative to the classic Coke that was offered in three years. The company didn't provide a specific reason for axing spice. Of course, you can follow all the latest company buzz on TREN Go on your Bloomberg terminal, but let's take a look at markets right now. Even though if you're looking for action, you're not going to find it on the index level. You can see the S&P 500, we're going to call that unchanged, maybe a little bit lower. Of course, it's not the slight gain we were looking at yesterday when we saw that 41st record high of 2024. Of course, taking a little bit of a breather. Same thing, too, if you take a look at the NASDAQ 100, currently down about a tenth of a percent pre-market. Small cap fighting for it. Of course, we were a little bit higher on the Russell 2000. Now we're going to go ahead and call that unchanged, Matt. Why? What does <laughs> Spiced have to do with Dr. Pepper? Why do Dr. Pepper because fans Dr. worry Pepper about... Because Dr. Pepper is spicy. But Coca-Cola Spiced had raspberry? But I don't... It was supposed to be a little bit spicy. I don't know. It's discontinued, so okay. now we'll never know. All right. Yeah, we can't try it now. Less than four minutes until the opening bell. We'll focus back in on Marcus of BlackRock's Gargi Chowdhury next. This is Bloomberg. Moments away from the start of trading, this is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. This market can be whatever you want it to be today. You can make something of this market. Right now, it's unchanged. It's just a blank canvas. Um, so do something with it. S&P futures uh, at zero. NASDAQ futures down one-tenth of one percent. Ringing the bell. This is pretty interesting. Uh, at the New York Stock Exchange, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, I'm not sure if it's official or if the New York Stock Exchange website just chose this. They refer to her as your excellency. Her excellency, Ursula von der Leyen, ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange after the 41st record close of the year on the S&P 500. Katie, are we going to see a 42nd record close today? You know, I don't know, but let's try to make something Your out of this market. Katie Greifeld? I'll try my best. An optimist might say we are very close to record highs. We got one yesterday. Maybe we'll get one today. A pessimist might say, I don't know, you look at this, you see a little bit of red for the NASDAQ 100, currently down a tenth of a percent. The uh, S&P 500, a little bit higher, a tenth of a percent. 
Small caps, meanwhile, unchanged, really taking a breather after that record run that we've been witnessed to. Meanwhile, let's take a look under the hood where we do have some action. We'll start with home builder KB Homes. It disappointed with net orders for the third quarter despite lowering interest rates and an outlook that topped Wall Street estimates. That was not enough. Chanel, you take a look at shares right now, currently down by more than 5%. Also, Katie, I know you're watching this one too. DJT, Trump's media company rebounding from the lowest level in years. Trump has vowed not to sell his majority stake. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. And in the meantime, I'm watching Trump Media and Technology Group, third day of gains, 3.9% higher, Matt. All right, Morgan Stanley analyst Adam Jonas downgraded a number of big automakers, including General Motors. You can see those shares are off, as are shares of Ford. Uh, uh, take a closer look at the auto stocks with Bloomberg's Abigail Doodle. Abby? Yeah, it's a big uh, downgrade of the U.S. auto sector. GM taking it the hardest down, about 3.7 percent, at least from the standpoint that at this point Rivian is down about the same amount. From the downgrade standpoint, those shares were actually cut to an underweight. The other share is basically an equal weight. And the call is very, very robust. But at the end of the day, it sounds like Adam Jonas thinks that there's lots of headwinds against some of these companies, including a quote unquote upward slope uh, amid vehicle affordability uh, out of reach that that remains out of reach for many consumers. In addition, he's talking about credit losses uh, for less than uh, prime customers. Uh, also, the significant capex commitment required for AI development. So lots of different factors here weighing on this auto sector today, a part of this overall uh, downgrade. These are among some of those factors that I was just mentioning. It's interesting, though, it's not all bad. He's actually upgraded uh, the auto dealers. If we take a look at Auto Nation, we're going to see that these shares are popping sharply higher here in the pre-market or on the open, I should say, up 1.9 percent. And this has to do with it doesn't entirely jive in some ways, but they're upgrading the franchise dealer complex, uh, deserving of a positive re multiple re-rating due to positive brand and U.S. geographic exposure. So lots of different factors here. Katie, we'll be watching these stocks all day long. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Of course, a big call from Adam Jonas, and of course, markets are listening. Let's broaden out this conversation now with Gargi Chowdhury. She is BlackRock Chief Investment and Portfolio Strategist for the Americas. Joining us on set, it's great to see you. Great to be here, thank you. So we were talking at the start of the hour about how it feels like there's not a lot of fear in this market. You take a look at the VIX below 16. You take a look at that bid for put protection. It's just not really there in a robust way. When you think about what we've learned over the past few weeks from the Fed, from the economy, from earnings, then you think about where we're going. What's the BlackRock view right now? Sure, Katie, and a great morning to be here with you because we just published our fall outlook for Q4, and we're answering some of these questions that you're asking. What did we learn over the last, you know, since the summer? And the big thing, I think, that is quite market-changing, or uh, at least for the near term, we think it's, ha it's going to have huge ramifications, is this idea that the Fed is going to preserve the downside for now, cutting 50 basis points when the economy is still going to be, remain really strong, and then promising to do further if needed. And I think that has meaningful ramifications for an economy that's already at pretty strong holding. So that's number one. The second thing that we've learned through the course of the summer, of course, is that inflation is making its way down towards that 2% level, which of course is really good news, allows the Fed to continue to feel comfortable, protect the downside for the economy. And the last thing that we've learned over the summer is that earnings, at least everything that we'd he we've uh, heard from right now, remains really robust and, most importantly, broadening out. So we take these three themes and we lay that into our outlook for, uh, for the next three months or so, where we talk about broadening out maybe to large cap value, keeping quality in the core of your portfolio, stepping out from cash, really important, so into hard. that intermediate part of the fixed income markets. Yes, hard, but so important. At these heights, you know, as we're at all time highs, <laughs> you know, to buy into this market takes courage. And I wonder um, if the labor market concerns you. We got a conference board um, consumer confidence number yesterday that was a real disappointment and they put out a labor differential which mm -hmm. is essentially jobs that are plentiful and easy to Hard get, to get yeah. it dropped to 12.6% uh, it had been 16.4 then they revised that down to 15.9 so but it still dropped from the August number that implies according to Barry Knapp over at Ironsides a 4.4% U3 unemployment number and an 8.2% U6 unemployment number underemployment if we're starting yeah. to talk yeah. About that, yeah. the labor market must be a concern. 
as of right now, I mean, obviously surveys are important. It does represent a few people that are responding to those surveys. But if you look at a broader array of data around the labor market, what I'm paying particular focus on is really how many people are getting laid off. Mm -hmm. The unemployment rate, as we know, especially when labor supply is going up, may not be the best indicator. But are people getting laid off? And I think when we start seeing that climb up meaningfully, that's when it becomes a driver of shock for the economy. For now, I think the Fed has given us a little bit of protection with that 50 basis point rate cut with more to come. You, and want, I another, think, you want another 50 basis points in November? I, 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 I think that right now they're going to watch what the data does. I, I don't think we're, we know enough to know that it's going to be another 50 basis points. But I do think that they are willing, they've shown us that they're willing to do whatever it takes if they think the data needs needs for that to be. I think this employment question is so important, particularly when you consider that the consumer sector, consumer discretionary, mm -hmm. has been the biggest gainer in the S&P 500 over the course of the last month. And by a margin, if you could take a look there, more than 7.4% higher, if the labor market starts to weaken, and it's not just Tesla, I took a look, guys, it's like Norwegian yeah. Cruise Lines right. and, and other right. big consumer stocks. If the labor market starts to weaken, does that trade unwind? I think if the labor market starts meaningfully weakening, I think some of these sectors can certainly feel a bit of weakness. And I also think that one of the areas, and we've talked about this here, one of the areas that has done really well is small cap stocks. And mm -hmm. they've sort of gotten this push behind them because of rates uh, becoming lower, coming lower. I think that's the area that I would be most cautious of going into the next couple of months. You know, Matt, you point out that, look, markets are at all-time highs, 41st all-time high, et cetera. And seasonally, September and October has seen a little bit of volatility, especially on election years. I think it's okay for investors to think about strategies that protect their downside for those looking for that protection. I think overall, history tells us that in cutting cycles, when the economy is fine, and you know, we talk about this in our outlook as well. There aren't very many cutting cycles when the economy <laughs> but is fine, when right? They, they cut happen, when the economy is in trouble. Absolutely, but when <laughs> they happen, and let's hope this is one, equity markets over a 12 month or even a six month period tend to do very well. Right. But that doesn't mean the next six weeks or the next eight weeks will be a straight line up. So for those investors that are looking to sort of protect their downside, there are so many ways in which they can do that with minimum volatility strategies, with buffered strategies, or you know, just stay high up in quality. And the area of the market that we like the most is really focusing on clipping coupon in the bond markets and in that intermediate belly of the curve. Interesting. Not in cash, but in the belly. Exactly. So we've been talking about how stepping out of cash, as, as difficult as it may feel, especially when yields were at above 5%, which certainly isn't the case anymore, we've talked about how these pause periods are really ripe and fertile for investments into high-quality equities and bond markets. Even though the rate cutting cycle has now begun and is going to continue in our view, that doesn't mean that you can't have positive gains from equities as well as from bond markets. So we're still getting opportunities to clip five, five and a half percent coupon without taking a huge amount of duration or down in quality risk. And I think that is the opportunity here. And, you know, at the end of the day, do you think that there's better opportunity here when it comes to equities or bonds? Because if you can kind of play, the, play it safe and yeah. go into the belly, then why take on risk at all-time highs? <laughs> so I think that certainly given what we're getting in the bond markets right now, so if, you, if you're allocated to something like uh, Bink, which is the BlackRock Income Fund, you You've can. You have heard of that. <laughs> yes, Rick I know. special. <laughs> exactly. But you can clip sort of five and a half, six percent in some of those funds if you're looking at something even like an uh, you know, just looking at IEI, which is just three to seven year treasuries, again, getting 4%. So I think there are some ways in which you can bolster your portfolio. I do think the Fed brings that negative correlation back. Hmm. The idea that they are there if the economy falters and they're not afraid to cut aggressively brings negative correlation back. But you don't need to take a lot of duration risk because you're not being paid to. So stay in the belly, clip your coupon. And I think that makes for a really robust portfolio. Gargi, thank you for joining us here yeah. on set. And happy birthday to you. I hope you get to enjoy that tonight. You work so hard. Of course, that is Gargi Chowdhury, BlackRock Chief Investment and Portfolio Strategist for the Americas.
Also want to take a look here quickly at Flutter because you have Flutter Entertainment shares reaching a record high, soaring almost 9% this morning because it had announced a $5 billion buyback of its shares. It also boosted its U.S. outlook. Uh, this is, of course, NFL season. People are placing their bets. It's also a company that moved its primary share listing to the New York from London earlier this year, one of Katie's favorite themes. We will keep an eye on that as we go along. DraftKings up higher as well. Now coming up, Tyson Foods gets a new sell rating as Piper Sandler sees beef, chicken, and pork headwinds. Details next in Top Calls. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Top Calls. Some of the analyst action in focus this morning. And first up, Piper Sandler is downgrading Tyson Foods to a sell rating, citing risk across all meat categories, including rising cattle costs, falling chicken prices, and potential pork pricing pressures. Next up, we have KeyBank upgrading DoorDash to a buy, saying that the delivery company is gaining ground in its, quote, core and emerging verticals. And finally, we have Barclays saying that HP Enterprise is now a buy. The firm is upgrading the IT company amid signs of a recovery in enterprise servers. Thales also sees HP Enterprise continuing to grow its AI server revenues, Matt. All right, let's turn to DJT now, shall we? Shares of Trump Media and Technology were near all-time lows this week, despite the end of a six-month lockup period on Friday, uh, or maybe because of the end of a six-month lockup period on Friday. Trump holds 57% of the company's outstanding stock and opted not to sell. That's what he says. Let's discuss this with Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz. So, Bailey, uh, what do we know about DJT? We know the lockup was lifted at the market close on Thursday, and we know that legally Donald Trump could not have, would have to file within two, day, two business days if he were to sell shares. So you can say, uh, because it's 945 on Wednesday, as far as we know, legally Donald Trump had not sold through 945 on Monday. When you look at the trading volume, though, 14 million shares traded on Thursday, 20, call it 21 to 20, uh, the three days between Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. So some heavier volume because we only saw about 8 million shares traded. But the other insiders, co-founders uh, that are United Atlantic Ventures, as well as uh, Patrick Orlando's ARC, they don't actually have to disclose. So they technically could have been a big part of that selling, and they account for about 15 million shares between the two of them. Well, I think that's what's fascinating about this. If you look at last week, it declined every single day. We're looking at two days of gains, 10% or more in total, on about 11%. It's still down significantly this year. Yes, yeah, down significantly this year, down about 30% this month. There was a lot of positioning around uh, the lockup expiring and who would sell and how quickly would, By the way, they would that's sell. typical, right? It's not that the stock is down despite the end of a lockup. The stock is usually down because of the end of a lockup. Well, especially when you have call it 15 million shares, about 9% of the company being held by insiders or former insiders who have nothing to do with the fundamental business anymore. Normally when you see an IPO, call it Reddit, when they go public, a lot of the insiders, their benefit, they benefit if the company still does better in the long term. If you're an executive, you want the company to perform. Uh, United Atlantic Ventures and ARC, they actually have nothing to do with the company, so they have no real incentive unless they believe in Trump media, but with the number of lawsuits between those founders and Donald Trump himself, you can kind of read the tea leaves and assume uh, that they likely would have been quick to get the exits. Bill, you said the word fundamentals, and that's exactly where I want to go, because even with the declines that we're seeing, DJT, it has a market cap of nearly $3 billion. This is theoretically a social media company. You take a look at Reddit's market cap, for example, $11 billion. They're not as far apart as you might expect when you think about the user base, for example. Well, when you look at the user, so Truth Social is the key asset for Trump Media, or yeah, Trump Media. Uh, They've had just under 400,000 uh, active users, um, have failed to top a million active users in the last year. So actually, when you kind of break out those numbers, it's kind of a tremendous drop off. They have been seeing kind of those numbers stabilize, but when you compare it to an X or to your point Reddit, even though we 
don't know what X is technically worth. Reddit is worth about five times that of Trump media. The user base actually is much smaller, though you can argue it's loyal. They did only have just under a million dollars in second quarter revenue, Reddit, though. So Reddit tops a million money. active users? I believe so. I'm kidding. Now you're putting me in. I'm kidding. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Bailey, thank you so very much. Of course, that is Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz, who has been following this story, as well as many other of our big equity names all year. Now, coming up, Jefferies is looking to keep the momentum going this year in trading and investment banking when it reports after the bell. We're going to take a look next in our Wall Street Beat. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. Let's take a look at the stock market right now, about 20 minutes into the trading day. You can see the S&P 500, it's still unchanged. I'm trying really hard to make this interesting. Uh, we were a little bit higher, now a little bit lower, and I don't know, now unchanged. Levels. Take a look. Levels matter. Levels yeah. matter. We're at very elevated heights. Important to keep that in mind. You take a look at big tech. A little bit more to talk about there. The Nasdaq 100 currently up about a tenth of a percent. And then you take a look at small caps. There's some action. Small caps currently down about four tenths of a percent on that Russell 2000 Shanali. And it's time now, Katie, for the Wall Street beat. Jeffrey is looking to show progress in its bid to gain market share in the investment banking world. The firm is set to report earnings after the bell today. And here to look at what's ahead is Bloomberg Finance reporter Catherine Doherty. You know, we look at Jeffrey's because it's kind of a bellwether, right? It's kind of telling you the way trading is going to shape up. We already have hints from the likes of Goldman that things are going to be a little weaker than they were in a gangbusters year ago. What do we expect from Jeffrey's? So the other element that we're going to be looking at here is within investment banking advisory and debt and equity underwriting so beyond trading those are some of the key factors that are going to make a difference when looking ahead to the other big banks that are going to be reporting in october jeffries will break out these elements and we'll start to get a flavor for what investment banking is going to look like across wall street in the u.s now the interesting part about jeffries too is that they really made a big on their people. They were hiring during uh, some downturns, during a hiring freeze at other peers across Wall Street. So they've said that because of that hiring that they did, they're able to then look to see momentum and, and pick up market share because of the talent that they've invested in. What does it tell us? I didn't know it was a, a bellwether. Ah. So well, it always scares me because it's like, oh, earnings season is somehow here again. <laughs> right. But so, so what, what can you take from Jeffries um, and use when you're looking at the rest of the street? So they always come out a week or two before the other big U.S. banks. Um, and it really is its core investment banking. So as Shanali said, trading will be the first kind of key uh, sector that we'll be looking at, and then advisory. Um, and that will give a, f a sense of where are deals? Are they picking back up um, compared to not just a year ago, but the previous quarter? Mm -hmm. Summer is typically a, a slower period, but we didn't have a very slow summer. So it, it remains to be seen whether that will come through in revenue. Um, and if advisory in particular is kind of the, the inflection point here. You know, I was just taking a look at the shares, and uh, I didn't realize this. Didn't know Jeffries was a bellwether necessarily. Didn't know that shares are up nearly 57% year to date. I mean, you compare that to JP Morgan, which we look at all the time, only up about 26% only. I mean, all in all, this is, has been a pretty good year for Jeffries in particular. They've been showing um, significant growth, uh, and they're not just attributing that to. Um, the overall market activity, but to market share gains, meaning that they're able to actually pick up and maintain the momentum that they've displayed. So we'll see if that comes through in the third quarter, whether their activity is, is it attributed to just more activity overall, in which case that could be at any bank. Um, but what they're saying is, no, we're actually picking up market share as well. Fun fact, Jeffries also is very heavily weighted towards private equity deals. And so as that comes back, <clears throat> presumably they would be the ones to benefit from it. In this lower interest wow, rate Wow, you know what? I just put a comp screen together. Look at this, Shanali. So Incredible. I put Jeffries against Goldman Sachs, JP mm -hmm. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Bank America, City. They outperform all of them over the past five years, up 253%, total return 313. So. They really are crushing it. Yeah, there you have it. Uh, all right, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Catherine Doherty there looking at the uh, banks for us, looking at Jeffrey's giving us a preview of what to expect. Let's get the trading diary so you know what to expect for the rest of the week. More Fed speak ahead. 
throughout the week, including Chair Powell's pre-recorded remarks to the 10th annual Treasury Market Conference. We're going to be paying extra special Thank close you. attention to that conference. Shanali has <laughs> uh, flagged it because we're going to hear from William Barr as well. Um, we get new home sales at the top of the next hour. We'll bring those to you as soon as they cross. The housing market, incredibly important and, well, I mean, just fascinating to follow. U.S. jobless claims uh, come out on Thursday, as well as durable goods and revised GDP. That'll be very interesting. We'll see what kind of growth we're looking at. And we round out the week with PCE, a look at the Fed's preferred inflation measure, as well as the University of Michigan's consumer sentiment on Friday, extra special because of the disappointment from the conference board. Absolutely. And then you think about what's going to be a catalyst for this kind of boring market. I would bet it's PCE. All right, coming up in the next hour, J.P. Morgan Sitara Sundar joins us on volatility, which, as Katie pointed out, you know, the VIX is at a real low place. We're sitting, obviously, at an all-time high in the S&P. We'll get her call for the index. And then the CEO of Rolls-Royce Motor Cars joins us to talk about the ultimate luxury vehicles and Rolls-Royce's new private office here in New York City. This is Bloomberg. We are 30 minutes into the trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. We get new home sales data in just a few seconds. The S&P 500 actually climbing a little bit before we get there. Currently up about a tenth of a percent. Meanwhile, bond yields continuing to tick higher as we await that new home sales data nearing 380 on, of course, the 10-year yield. We got it. New home sales are up, uh, well, I should say down, less than had been anticipated. So the drop we were looking for in month-over-month -month new home sales was 5.3%. They actually fell only 4.7%, which is still a pretty significant drop for new home sales. Um, the number in August, 716,000. We were looking for 700,000, but it's been a part of the market that just has been... Um, immovable. It's been tough to come back, but coming in higher than estimates, you can take that as a positive. We are looking at silver linings today, guys. Yes. And, mm -hmm. you know, yesterday, speaking of silver linings, we spoke to David Costin. He's Goldman's chief U.S. equity strategist. We are talked to him about where he sees markets going. His S&P target, of course, below where we stand today, but he sees a ride higher after the U.S. election. This is what he had to say. We look out uh, a year from now, S&P 500 likely to be closer to 6,000. It's a target we have. Uh, so we think about sort of near-term target, 5,600 at the end of this year, and maybe 12 months ahead, uh, looking around, uh, around 6,000. We're going to get some more insight now into markets. Joined now by Sitara Sundar. She's J.P. Morgan private bank global equity strategist. She also expects modest upside in the S&P 500 into the middle of next year. It's interesting because you have David Kostin over at Goldman. Mm -hmm. You had Binky Chada earlier in the last hour over at Deutsche Bank. Everyone expects some volatility headed into the election. The question is, how do you play it? Mm, okay, first, thank you so much for, for having me. I think... It's exactly right that we're going to see volatility. Historically, we have seen volatility heading up into the big presidential election that is coming up in, in November. What we see is, again, modest upside over the next 12 months into mid-year 2025 in the S&P 500 at the index level. However, there will be dispersion under the hood. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking to do is capitalize on that volatility, and specifically in areas within technology, outside of just semiconductors, which have led a majority of the rally that we've seen so far this year and into some of the higher quality software names, as well as higher quality industrials, where we're seeing the boost from these secular tailwinds when you think about reshoring the revitalization of the U.S. industrial economy coming from broad support on industrial policy that we've seen, not just over the past year, but over the past several years since 2020. Those are the areas where we're looking to capitalize on any type of volatility that comes on those longer term opportunity sets. Well, I'm glad you brought up dispersion, particularly in the tech sector, because mm. it's been all about hardware, of course. It's been all about chip makers such as NVIDIA. Uh, software has struggled a little bit relative, of course, to that performance. What do you see as the catalyst for that sort of broadening out, that dispersion that you talk about? So it's a great question, and there are a couple of things. One, what we've seen so far is exactly that. So far this year, 
the S&P 500 tech sector is up 25 percent. 65 percent of those returns have been attributed to semiconductors. Software has lagged. So what are the catalysts? This upcoming earnings season, we're expecting to see some inflection higher in underlying earnings growth and revenue drivers of these high quality software companies. Also, what we're expecting to see is this understanding and the market appreciation of this newfound capital discipline and focus on cash flow generation in so high quality software companies now that honestly did not exist in such a meaningful way prior to the pandemic and prior to COVID. 2022, I think, brought a lot of this focus on cash flow generation in the here and now and ensuring that your CapEx plans are going to lead to monetization and real revenue growth moving forward. So in the Q4 environment and earnings season, we're starting to see that and we expect to see that in some of these higher quality names. And as we think about the entire artificial intelligence value chain, normally when we start to see this type of innovation within technology, it accrues to the infrastructure players first, and then it starts to broaden out. Right. And that's where we're gonna to start to see this opportunity set as we start to see artificial intelligence get integrated outside of just the semiconductor complex, but into our day-to-day -day lives and into the everyday business where software is going to start to become incorporated more. It's interesting, uh, I was reading this morning Gina Martin Adams note on big tech, she's a Bloomberg, she runs Bloomberg Intelligence for us. And she pointed out that chips and hardware, which make up 57%, almost 58% of the whole tech um, mm -hmm. uh, universe have, you know, bad relative valuations. They have bad, a bad earnings outlook. I mean, everything is unfavorable other than momentum. It's the only thing they really have on their side. And if you look at the rest of the tech universe, which is IT services, comms equipment, software, and electronics equipment, um, they're all uh, trading at a discount to their pre-pandemic average. If you look at the 2015 to 2019 average. So do you maybe take some profits out of chips and put them into software? So I think that's the right question. And yes, when we think about fall, a lot of what we tend to think about is revitalization and reflection on the year ahead. And what we've seen so far over the past couple of years is this dominance of semiconductors from a return perspective, not just this year, but over the past couple of years. So we engage with our clients on what we call portfolio health checks. And a lot of the initial positions within tech and within semiconductors specifically have become outsized given the concentration of returns. So taking some chips off the table and leaning into areas where the long-term earnings growth drivers are still there, but the market has not yet appreciated it. And that's high quality software companies and those valuations indeed are still in line, if not at a discount to pre-COVID multiples. And we don't think that's justified. We think that'll change moving forward. Sticking on the AI theme here, there has been news overnight that OpenAI in particular is in talks with the Biden administration about a giant build out of data centers. When mm -hmm. I talk about a giant build out, five gigawatt data centers, roughly the equivalent of five nuclear reactors each. So big, big build out here. That requires a lot of money, could require a lot of government spending. But this has been such a massive trade. You have to wonder if on Wall Street too much money is going to be flowing into that data center, energy trade around AI at too fast a pace. Do you ever worry about that? So it's part of the risk that we're, we're watching. I think the biggest thing that we're focusing on now is not just investment, but return on investment on many of the dollars that are put to work within this space. This is a multi-year trend, and I think we need to remind ourselves of that when we see this type of short-term run in, in many names. Artificial intelligence will be here to stay for the next, next decade plus. We're going to see investment within revitalizing, with, whether it's data centers or whether it's the entire energy infrastructure that we have within the United States. And that's energy infrastructure, that's electrical infrastructure, and that's just broader infrastructure that we're seeing within the US. The, fixed, the age of fixed assets within the United States is at the oldest age it's been in the past 70 years. We have an aging infrastructure within the US. Money will be spent within this area and while it's a concern in terms of the amount of dollars that are being put to work now, we don't see that trend slowing. Mm. And when we're thinking about ways to play it, which is at the end of the day, what our clients ask us about, 
we still think that there are long-term opportunities within infrastructure and tangentially within industrials. Because at the end of the day, these are assets that have historically been priced as cyclical because the earnings themselves have been cyclical and trading with the economic cycle. We think that there's potential for these earnings to become secular in nature, so right. cycle agnostic. So when you think about that, you have two potential drivers of returns moving forward over the long run. You have long-term earnings growth from secular drivers, and you have the potential for multiple re-rating as these companies get priced from historically cyclical to right. cycle agnostic and secular. Right, these changing definitions, these changing classifications, they're fascinating to watch happen, especially in real time. But let's try to talk about something other than AI. It's really hard to, but <laughs> I do want to talk about cash because you make the point mm. in your notes that the S&P 500, it's meaningly outperformed cash in prior Fed cutting cycles yes. that coincided with the soft landing over the past 50 years. But we were having this conversation with Gargi Chowdhury uh, just a couple minutes ago that it's very, very hard to step out of cash. So even with rates coming down, of course, even with more rates, uh, rate cuts expected. Do you think that we'll actually see a substantial exit from money market funds? So it's the number one question that we're getting from our clients right now. What to do with the impending Fed cutting cycle and our base case of, of a soft landing. I think the biggest thing for us when we talk to our clients is meeting clients where they are. If there are clients that are worried about stepping out of money market funds, we tend to, while we still think that there's long-term appreciation opportunities and equities, and equities will be the growth driver of long-term client portfolios, for those clients who are still a little bit nervous about markets, still a little bit nervous about the volatility that we're likely going to see over the next few months, we have been positioning those clients in areas that are higher quality and higher yielding. So income-oriented equities and dividends are starting to become a bigger part of that conversation mm. because as those yields come down, those higher dividend yielding starts start to look a little bit more attractive on a relative performance perspective. And historically, in any type of market volatility or drawdown, that income provides protection. By the way, do you have a preferred way to play it? Do you like an ETF? Do you like... How do you put that uh, money to work and in income? So our preferred way to play it, just given the dispersion that we see even within the dividend players, there's a difference between high yield dividend stocks and dividend growing stocks is within the active management space. So within our JP Morgan Asset Management franchise, we have a lot of really great opportunities to invest in that place. But active management, I think, is very key because we're going to see dispersion there. And there is going to be a difference between higher yielding stocks, which can trade like bond, bond proxies versus dividend growing stocks, which can give you that protection, but also that long-term capital appreciation that clients want to see in their equity portfolios. All right, so the hunt for income, it's still on, it's just evolving. Really enjoyed this conversation. Hope to see you again soon. That, of course, is Sitara Sundar of J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 up about a tenth of a percent. Let's take a look at what's moving beneath the hood. We're going to do that with Abigail Doolittle. One stock helping out here, HP Enterprises. This is Barclays has upgraded the shares to an overweight from an equal weight. The analysts there saying that this stock is really the best way to invest in an emerging trend of enterprise recovery. In particular for this stock, it's a, the best play because of its lack of a quote-unquote AI premium. So related to that, Barclays sees this company continuing to grow its AI server revenues and also thinks that there could be a recovery for their storage business, and they think that the Juniper acquisition will be accretive. Turning to Flutter, we're seeing an all-time high here. This is the online betting uh, parent gambling uh, company. Parent uh, is at up 9%. As they announce a $5 billion buyback, they're also talking big numbers for the overall U.S. betting number, saying that it could get to $60 billion by 2020, 2030. That would be a 50% increase from what we're looking at now. And FanDuel, uh, that their revenue is expected to hit $21 billion by 2027. We see DraftKings going along for the ride. And then, Matt, one for your after your own heart, although I don't know if you like the fact that it's bearish, or at least this piece of it. We do, of course, have Adam Jonas over at Morgan Stanley today cutting some of the big U.S. automakers, basically saying that there's a ton of headwinds out there, Ford to an equal weight, General Motors to an underweight at the lows. That stock down nearly 7%, the worst day at that point since 2022. Some of those headwinds, rising inventories, credit and consumer issues, China competition, AI integration issues. It's a very robust call, and you can see these stocks really taking it seriously. I like to read any Adam, Joseph, Adam Jonas note 
and I would hope that at some point we can get Adam Jonas to come on this program and talk to <laughs> us. Ah, good idea. About it. Get it past the compliance department, Adam, and please come on the program. <laughs> Abby, thanks very much. Abigail Doolittle looking at the stocks for us. Coming up, Harris and Trump ramp up their economic messages with a focus on jobs. The latest on the campaign trail next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get out of high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. The global economy is looking stable. The stresses of strong inflation are easing and the central banks are cautiously loosening policy. The OECD released its forecasts and only slightly tweaked its May outlook with a 10 basis point raise to its outlook for global GDP. However, the organization warned of significant risks on the horizon. SAP shares have fallen the most since early August after Bloomberg reported that the German software giant is among companies being investigated by the U.S. Justice Department for allegedly conspiring to overcharge government agencies, potentially including the military over the course of a decade. The DOJ is also looking at a unit of Accenture and started looking into this uh, potentially alleged plot back in 2022. And Kamala Harris has a pitch for manufacturers. The Democratic presidential nominee is going to outline her pragmatic economic vision in Pittsburgh today. She's expected to present some new initiatives to bolster domestic manufacturing and rival former President Trump's polling advantage on what is his defining issue. Katie? Well, let's stick with U.S. politics right now and keep the conversation going with Bloomberg's Enda Curran, who joins us from Washington. And you think about the polls, of course, Kamala Harris has been gaining momentum, and you can, we can see that in these results. But when it comes to the economy, still, that's seen as one of her political viabilities when you think about how she's perceived relative to Donald Trump. Yeah, Vice President Harris is trailing Donald Trump when it comes to who's better at managing the economy, but she's closing that gap uh, as you mentioned, uh, and that this speech today is expected to be the latest kind of plank on her economic policy platform to appeal to uh, workers and voters out there, that she also has ideas to rejuvenate manufacturing. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, you know, former President Trump, he's put manufacturing front and centre in terms of what his pitch to voters. Today we're expected to get some detail around initiatives that Vice President Harris would push through. Uh, but she's also expected to have a dual message in it. She's concerned about workers benefits and wages. She'll put a focus on that. But she's also willing, of course, to sit down and break bread with big business. She's trying to um, get across both points of view in the speech today. And we are expecting something of a more lengthy economic policy document from the vice president's team at some point soon as well. So it just it all underscores how the economy and then within the economy, manufacturing and jobs are very much at the centre of the, uh, the next few weeks in the run up to the vote. You know, I think this moment is pretty important just because she will be in Pittsburgh. And of course, Pennsylvania, swing state. You have Pittsburgh, a large industrial past, deep ties to unions and organized labor. And if you think about her message that she will be delivering today, you made a point here that Donald Trump is also putting manufacturing front and center. How important is, her, is it for her to get in front of that message as well? And does it perhaps conflict with other parts of her messaging? Well, you're quite right, Sonali. It is certainly a very symbolic uh, location for that speech. Uh, now, we haven't had, you know, in terms of trade policy or manufacturing policy, former President Trump has probably been out front in terms of aggressive ideas. He's talking about tariffs on trading rivals. He's talking about bringing in the corporate tax rate to, and putting tariffs on imported goods unless you uh, relocate production to the U.S. So, you know, he, I think he, in terms of uh, trade policy, he's probably on the more hawkish side Whereas Vice President Harris, she says she wants to protect workers' jobs. She spoke about this idea that Donald Trump is planning a tax on consumers, but she hasn't really fleshed out yet, I think, what she would do in terms of trade policy and, by extension, what she would do for, for manufacturing sector per se. But there's no doubt that both campaigns really are trying to clamour for that sort of middle ground. They're both trying to pitch their, their lot to voters, that they're the ones to trust with rejuvenating manufacturing and getting jobs in some of those areas that have lost jobs over the decades, in particular in the so-called China shock years. 
All right, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Enda Curran covers politics for us out of Washington, D.C. You can find the latest election coverage by going to ELEC Go on your terminal. Also highly recommend you look at our uh, chart libraries, WSL uh, space election or WSL space elect map are great ways to look at uh, the polling and the betting markets ahead of this uh, presidential election. Still ahead, Wall Street bigwigs are driving an office renaissance on Park Avenue. Maybe office space is a hot commodity. Details next. This is Bloomberg. All eyes on the housing market and no surprise that this is the top story of the day. For the second straight week, applications to refinance mortgages are surging. The Mortgage Bankers Association refinancing index has reached the highest level since 2022. And this refinancing wave comes as the 30-year fixed mortgage falls for an eighth straight week. And that is not the only wave in the real estate industry drawing headlines. Wall Street firms are driving a revival in the demand for office real estate. Tale of two cities here between residential and commercial. Here with more is Bloomberg's Nora Melinda. Why don't I just really quickly get your view here? Because if people are refinancing, there's a potential problem here that people are borrowing to finance their existing homes rather than borrowing to finance new homes. And that's a really good point talking about that dynamic because, I mean, we've seen home builders surging Honestly, for over a year, it's been a buoyant rally that they've had, and that's essentially because we've seen a housing market that's been so locked. We're seeing people who are sitting here in houses, existing homes, and they don't want to move. They're not looking to move and take on a crazy high mortgage rate that they don't currently have right now, and that's making it very limited inventory for home buyers. A lot of millennials who are looking to move is making it harder for them to find homes on the market that aren't new homes. I want to talk about a research note that landed in my uh, inbox this morning because I've been watching XHB all year. That, of course, is one of the biggest home building ETFs out there. It's up, I don't know, over 100 percent, something close to that. <laughs> and uh, there was a note from Matt Mealy this morning saying that housing stocks, we might see a sell the news reaction to the Fed cutting cycle, that basically investors should be careful about chasing them at these very overbought levels. What are you hearing from your sources, from the analysts and investors you speak to? Definitely a mixed view, but I would say more leaning toward the end of people still being bullish. I think it's interesting because you do talk to some analysts. I've spoken to some analysts who wonder whether or not we have hit the top. Have we seen all that we can see from them? But I mean, I do think that pointing to the note that you just mentioned, and when you think about the dynamic of new or existing homes coming online, what will that make the environment, the broader landscape look like for home builders? Will they now have increased competition, especially yep. as we get to that prime number where home buyers are ready to jump back into the market? Yeah, it's a very good point. If that market starts to loosen up, it can uh, shake a lot of things. In terms of office, which is obviously a very different market from, you know, Lennar building a luxury home or Pulte or whatever, um, I would have thought all of it is going at massive discounts. I mean, we constantly talk about stories where office buildings are going for 67% off right here in New York. But you wrote a story about how SL Green and purveyors of office space on Park Avenue are actually doing really well. They are. And um, SL Green in particular is actually the best performing office re in an index that I track for the year. And it's really interesting that you brought up the idea of asking rents because according to a note that I inspired this story, essentially asking rents for high quality buildings in Manhattan have remained unchanged. But you are still seeing a pickup from a lot of those larger companies. Uh, the financial sector is actually seeing its highest employment since the 1990s. And so you're seeing a lot of these companies that are really trying to position themselves closer to Grand Central Terminal and Park Avenue is benefiting from that. All right, Nora, it's a great story. Really appreciate your reporting as always. Our thanks, of course, to Nora Melinda. She is a Bloomberg reporter. And coming up, Rolls-Royce is kicking into high gear in New York City as it opens up an office in the heart of the Big Apple. We'll speak to Chris Brownridge. He is Rolls-Royce Motor Cars CEO next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Open Interest. About an hour into the U.S. trading day, let's get a check on these markets with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Well, Katie, let's take a look at that S&P 500 because on the day, not really doing all that much, but we are up for a third day in a row right now, up about six tenths of one percent over that time period. And you can see uh, this move lower off of yesterday's big high. But nonetheless, we are in this uh, win streak. And again, over uh, this is actually SAP, not the S&P 500. I'm looking at the S&P 500 over there up about half a percent. Beneath the S&P 500's relatively benign surface, let's take a look at what's moving because there are some significant movers there. Here's the S&P 500 uh, three-day chart, up about half a percent over that time period. Beneath the surface, again, over the last three days, up about half a percent, but on the day, just flipping around very small moves. We have NVIDIA nicely higher, up about three percent. This as uh, it is reported that CEO Jensen Wong has sold uh, $713 million worth of the stock and that he's done now, it would make sense in terms of the pressure we've seen on that stock that there has been a consistent seller. If that is in fact true that he's done, then perhaps the stock will get out of its range. We have Intel up even more, up 4.4%. Lots of speculation about whether or not they will accept uh, some money $5 billion, up to $5 billion from Apollo Group, or are they going to consider some sort of a friendly takeover for Qualcomm? Stay tuned for more on that. KB Homes down 4.2%. This having to do with the fact uh, that they missed earnings, their orders below, and apparently demand was choppy, but the bright spot is some are saying that uh, September and August a little bit more firm. And then ExxonMobil, uh, the biggest point decliner on the S&P 500 today, down 1.4%, really a drag this is oils down more than 1%. It's going to be very interesting to see because if we take a look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index in this terminal chart, and right now we are on pace for an 11th uh, day of gains, a lot of this having to do with that China stimulus, the dollar weakness because of China is the world's largest user of natural resources. If commodities can hang on to this small gain, 11 up days in a row, the longest winning streak, Matt, going all the way back to 2018. All right, great stuff, Abby. Thanks so much for joining us. Abigail Doolittle talking to us about these markets. Let's talk about cars right now. Rolls-Royce sells arguably the world's most luxurious motor cars, but they don't want to sell more of them, just higher priced versions of each one. In order to do that, the Goodwood-based manufacturer has opened up a private office right here in New York City for its highest net worth clients in America to help design increasingly individual masterpieces, as the CEO refers to them. Uh, let's bring him in to talk about lifting luxury margins. Uh, and contributing those to parent company BMW. Chris Brownridge uh, runs the company now, and he joins us from the private office down in the Meatpacking District. Chris, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. I, I wonder if you could start by telling us what your goals are in terms of your contributions to BMW, in terms of growing margins. Um, what do you want to achieve in your, say, first couple of years as CEO? Oh, good morning, Matt, and uh, it's great to be here in New York. I'm sitting in our private office, and that's a great place to start. Um, the, the whole business at Rolls-Royce is about creating value for our clients, and what we're seeing is increasing uh, demand from our clients for more and more bespoke and personal motor cars, and the whole private office uh, network that we're setting up is designed to really create an environment where we can engage with them directly uh, with our design team. Uh, and so we, we see a, a, you know, a great opportunity and our client feedback about uh, the private office is, is extremely encouraging. So you have, uh, I believe you have setups like this in other hubs in Dubai, um, for example, in Shanghai, for example. How um, strong are they in terms of contributing to, to margin growth? Well, uh, the New York private office is one of a network, and as you say, we have a, a number around the world. We started uh, with the home of Rolls-Royce in Goodwood, where our clients would come to us and so they could meet the team and we could work with them to create their own bespoke Rolls-Royce. Uh, and this is a growing aspect of our business. For example, in Shanghai, in the first six months of the private office being open, we had engagements with more than 200 clients. So it's clearly something that resonates with our target audience. It creates a unique experience for them. And Chris, I want to talk about global demand, but I particularly want to talk about Chinese demand because, of course, you think about what we've seen out of China this week, a big bang of stimulus measures and uh, wildly different industries here. But we were talking to the CEO of Pandora, for example, who said that they're strong everywhere except in China. What are you seeing when it comes to China, when it comes to Rolls-Royce specifically? 
Sure. Well, it, it's clear at the moment in China, the luxury industry uh, is, is, is on some, you know, experiencing some more challenging times. But the Chinese market is very important to Rolls-Royce, and that's why we've invested in it. In fact, we've opened a private office in Shanghai because we see a growing number of ultra-high net worth individuals. And certainly what we've seen since that private office has been open is more profound engagements with our clients. You know, it's always been an important region for us, and it will continue to be for the future. Even if you're looking at the long term in China, Chris, what does that mean for more immediate demand? And wondering if this bigger push into the U.S. with this new New York office starts to offset any weaknesses you might be seeing across the globe. Well, Rolls-Royce is a, a, a brand which, with a great heritage and history. And, of course, we have clients all around the world. And, and we've seen over many years fluctuations in demand in every region of the world. And that's the great thing about our business. We're super flexible, super agile. And of course, we've got clients all over the world. So if one region is up, there's always another one that may be down. But overall, we can balance our business really effectively because we're so very agile. It does seem like, um, you know, within luxury, we see the lower end uh, kind of struggling. The higher end, we talk to, for example, executives at Lamborghini and Ferrari, and they continue to do gangbusters business. Do you notice a growth in high net worth individuals? Is that what's powering um, this drive at the top end of luxury? Yeah, very much so. And in response to the growing demand for our clients, we're opening these private offices, but we're also investing in the home of Rolls Royce. We're expanding our, our facility there, not so we can build more motor cars, but so we can build more precious and special motor cars for our clients. We need more space for these bespoke commissions. And we're certainly seeing over the last years a real growth in demand for more personalized and more, uh, uh, more specific uh, requests from our clients. Uh, but also what they particularly value is the experience that we deliver them. And that's why when our clients can't come to Goodwood, Goodwood comes to the clients. And that's why we have our private offices. So where I'm sitting here, in New York, this is a little bit of Goodwood. It's like an outpost to where our clients are. Well, let's talk about some of your new models, of course. I'm thinking about Spectre. It's your new all-electric model in its first year of deliveries. A little bit of a setback here, of course, some recalls in place. What measures are you putting in place to deal with that recall? Uh, so uh, Spectre, we launched this year, and it's been a great success for us. Our clients' feedback about Spectre is they absolutely love the way the motor car drives. It's a super coupe. It's absolutely stunning to look at, and it's a great palette for uh, or canvas uh, for personalization. Uh, we, we had this uh, topic in terms of the recall, but what we're doing is we're handling that as efficiently as possible to make sure that our clients are not inconvenienced. And our team have done a really good job of that, and we're making sure that we're quick to respond and we give all our clients the reassurance that they deserve. Which BMW, uh, you know, which Rolls Royce vehicles are affected by this recall? Of course, we saw that profit warning out by your parent company, BMW. Can you give a sense of kind of where else the issue lies? Uh, the, the, the topic that we're discussing right now uh, specifically uh, affects Spectre and only Spectre. And in the North America area, there are 600 vehicles affected, and we have a plan of action for each and every one of them. I, I wonder what new models we can expect in the future, Chris. You have... Um, you know, on your ICE cars, uh, twin turbocharged V12, you know, 6.7 liter engine that just makes me salivate. Um, is it possible that that is married with electric power? Could we see a hybrid in the future for Rolls Royce? Well, one of the things that's always true about Rolls Royce is that we don't compromise. And um, with our V12 power plant today uh, in our model range, it's a fabulous piece of engineering. And also with Spectre, we've uh, delivered a, a motor car using electrification. And again, our plant feedback is that it's a perfect Rolls Royce. We'll never compromise. We always deliver the best possible powertrain for our clients. As for future motor cars, well, I wouldn't want to give any secrets away right now. But <laughs> what I can tell you is there's a very exciting future for Rolls Royce. A very exciting future. You're not going to give away secrets right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm still going to try. Are clients asking yeah. for a hybrid? When you think about the Rolls-Royce customer base, are they asking for hybrids? Um, our, our clients, uh, uh, they, they tell us they love the V12, and they also tell us that they love Spectre as well. The thing that they love is the way a Rolls-Royce drives. It's that waftability, that ease of driving, and absolute silence when they're driving. And, and both powertrains that we have deliver that in spades. Driving a Rolls-Royce is always a special occasion or indeed being driven in one. And that will always be the case with every Rolls-Royce that we make. In terms of what you're doing down there, um, do you envision a time when Rolls-Royce is putting out more 
one-off models? I mean, right now you've got, uh, you know, Ghost and Cullinan and Phantom and Spectre, but yes. are you going to be doing really individual pieces for high net worth individuals? Well, we already today uh, produce uh, in very small numbers coach built motor cars for our most demanding clients. Uh, and these are, are real showpieces of, our, of the possibilities of our craftspeople and artists who work in, in Goodwood. But I'd argue today every Rolls Royce is a bespoke work of art. Uh, and that is our mission, is to uh, increase the specific content for each specific client in every Rolls Royce, because ultimately they are a masterpiece for our clients. They really do represent the best of craftsmanship and the most uh, special, uh, specific content for our clients. And that's what we're very, very proud of at Rolls-Royce. All right, when I listed the models, I left off Wraith, which is oh, one of my favorites, I have to say, <laughs> uh, as well. Uh, a power coupe. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Chris Brownridge there of Rolls-Royce Motor Cars at his new private office in downtown New York. Be sure to listen, by the way, to my podcast, Hot Pursuit. You can get it on Apple or Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Hannah Elliott. And I, uh, she's the luxury reporters, uh, reporter for Pursuits. We spent an hour with Chris yesterday, and I think you'll find it interesting. That episode comes out on Friday. Definitely check it out. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our daily Wall Street Week conversation. And Pittsburgh has evolved from a steel city to a more diversified economy that includes tech and services. But its football team, the Steelers, has remained a constant. David Weston asked Steelers owner Art Rooney how the city has changed. We've been fortunate uh, to be in this community now for over 90 years. But I have to say, I think things uh, changed for for the city and for our franchise in the 70s when we had the great teams and and uh, really the the time before that was uh, pretty much some rough times for the Steelers and uh, but things turned around in the 70s and it was at a time when when the city and the region was really going through some hard times in terms of the steel industry and, and related businesses uh, you know collapsing around us and so uh, the Steelers were kind of what people held, held on to at that time, and uh, a lot of people left the area, you know, over that period of time, and so that sort of started the uh, uh, Steelers nation being spread out, you know, all across the country, and uh, so it's been, uh, you know, since the 70s, it's been a great, a great run. And, and the Steelers have been a constant through all of that. Uh, what else has remained constant in terms of, if I can say, the DNA? of the business community, the economy in Pittsburgh, through these really big changes? You know, I think one of the, the, the legacies of the steel and manufacturing era are the foundations that we have in the city, the Mellon Foundation, uh, the Hillman Foundation, and I could go you know, down, down a list of, of foundations that you know, grew from the, the money that was generated back in the manufacturing days, and so you know, those foundations, for one thing, have supported sites like our facility is on today. It was, it was bought by some foundations to, to convert a brownfield into, you know, now a fully developed site. So they've been instrumental in, in really helping us make that transition. Uh, still the, the uh, you know, the foundations, the universities that they have supported, University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, of course, uh, you know, we just have some great institutions that have also become, uh, you know, part of the foundation of the, of the economy here. How has the workforce in Pittsburgh evolved? Because as you say, it was a blue collar manufacturing, the classic Rust Belt, uh, basically. And now you're talking about, as you say, eds and meds, you've got tech, which is a very different area than what steel was. How has the workforce evolved into that new world? Well, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, Part of the uh, you know the the benefit we have of having some great educational facilities around here, where uh, you know they're they're putting out uh, you know the intellectual uh, kind of people that we need to you know to be successful in a tech world, uh, and of course you know there, there's been uh, support from the foundations when you when you look at that. So uh, and that you know we now have uh, I would say more people that you know come into Pittsburgh and from other parts of the country to relocate here and take jobs here 
more so than we you know than we've had in recent times. So uh, it's a combination of a lot of things, but I think that the workforce has certainly changed, and and uh, you know I think we're ready for the future. Well, let's talk about the future. Uh, the future of Pittsburgh. Before we get to the future of the Steelers, what, how do you see the future of Pittsburgh? What comes next for Pittsburgh? You know, I think uh, continuing to evolve into this technology-based kind of economy, and and uh, you know, as I said, the you know the uh, students and the, uh, the even the professors, the research that's being done here in, in a lot of different areas, uh, uh, both in tech and in, in uh, the medical sciences. Uh, you know, th that's the future of Pittsburgh, I think, and uh, I think we're well positioned to take advantage of that. When we talk nationally about economic growth, we talk a lot about investment, the need for investment, whether it's infrastructure or in education or whatever. Is there investment coming into Pittsburgh? Is there investment being made by the business community of Pittsburgh? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, there could be more, and I think that's something we're going to need in, in the future is more investment in Pittsburgh and, and more investment from uh, uh, you know, firms that are interested in investing in some some of the tech companies that are evolving out of the universities. Uh, some of that's very very early stage in terms of the robotic uh, sciences. So, uh, but you know, we have a lot of work to do on that front. But I think uh, people are starting to recognize that Pittsburgh is a different place than the old smoky city that some people used to think of us as. And that was Pittsburgh Steelers owner Art Rooney speaking with David West. And you can catch Wall Street Week every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. We're going to turn now to a major player in the cybersecurity space, Wiz. It walked away from a $23 billion takeover from Google earlier this year and is in talks to sell existing shares at a valuation of as much as $20 billion. We're going to discuss this with Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. And we have reported here at Bloomberg that the range is from $15 billion to $20 billion. That's a significant range, especially when you were talking about a $23 billion takeover here. What's at stake with Wiz's valuation? And can they hit that mark, you think? I mean, look, they refused their $23 billion offer. So obviously, they had the confidence that they can ramp up the company. And right now, the timing is especially interesting because we just had the CrowdStrike outage. Everyone is focused on how CrowdStrike could influence, you know, an operating system in such a big way. So Wiz's concept is of agentless security. Like their security solutions don't involve changes to the operating system. And this is one of the fastest growing names out there. I mean, there is a reason why Alphabet was paying over 40 times sales for a company that's still a startup. And I, I think it just goes to show that it has the potential. And I wouldn't be surprised if they are able to fetch a funding round at this valuation. And what does that mean in the path to IPO? You say that this has the potential, of yeah. course, here. And uh, maybe it will reach that valuation. When does it hit the public markets? Oh, well, it's hard to anticipate, but I would say that the timing is ripe given, you know, the interest around deploying generative AI and, uh, you know, making sure you don't have a repeat of the CrowdStrike outage. So something like a Viz, which is a native cloud solution, has had very high growth rates. I mean, uh, you could expect them to tap the public markets while, you know, the CrowdStrike news is quite hot. <laughs> the uh, story by Ryan Velastelica, who uh, writes on tech mm -hmm. for Bloomberg News. The headline is so tantalizing. Micron's <laughs> results may reveal an AI winner trading at a discount. I could make some real money yeah. here. <laughs> Why did you have to say it like that? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think about that? What do we expect? I mean, look, we know memory is very cyclical. And that hasn't changed even with this AI cycle where memory, high bandwidth memory is the rage right now. Everyone is focused on what kind of supply demand dynamics are there. Clearly, there are supply constraints. Micron is sold out to 25 and 26, but the stock has actually declined 40% uh, over the last uh, few weeks. So clearly, there is some nervousness around what the upside potential is. And it doesn't look like an NVIDIA story where there will be a beat and raise of the magnitude that NVIDIA has done. So memory has very different dynamics, but I think the biggest concern is how much gross margins are going to expand in this cycle. It looks like it's still early stage with the memory cycle, but with memory, you never know. And that's where, you know, the stock is so volatile because 
if the gross margin stops expanding, the stock uh, is going down. Well, to that end, and pretty quickly here, Mandeep, how concerning is CapEx right now? If we're worried about a CapEx cycle, is that the problem for Micron? I mean, right now, as much uh, high bandwidth memory they can make, uh, there are customers who want that. So uh, clearly, they want to expand their capacity on the HPM side, but they don't have enough. And so any CapEx they allocate to that, I think, would be cheered. All right, Mandeep, always great to uh, check in with you. Great preview of those Micron results that we are waiting for. That, of course, is Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. Meanwhile, let's get a check on these markets right now. Pretty quiet if you look at the S&P 500, the big, broad benchmark. But then you take a look at the NASDAQ 100. A little bit more action there, of course. We've been talking about how quiet things are. We have some movement, of course, for the NASDAQ 100. Big tech currently up about three-tenths of a percent. Of course, we're talking about small moves overall, but still, nonetheless, and all the while, you have the bond market continuing to sell off a little bit higher each day on that 10-year Treasury yield, currently up to the tune of about four basis points. We are nearing in on 380. What does that mean for the expectations that we have at the November meeting for the Fed? Like that yields continue Perhaps to rise we here. went too far. Perhaps we've been too aggressive with our pricing. And I'm going to get really weird because, of course, we know that Treasury Market Structure Conference is tomorrow here in New York. And, you know, there's a lot of concern. With William Barr? <laughs> uh, Michael Barr. Ah, uh, yes. The right, Fed Jack Vice guy. Chair. I misspoke. <laughs> Uh, too funny. Anyways, uh, yeah, yeah. people are worried that the long end is suppressed because of where we stand with QT. Let's see is that talking. weird, though? Totally weird. Is either one of you doing the close today? Thank no. God, no. <laughs> anyway, that we'll was, be excited. That was open interest. Have a great day. This is Bloomberg.